What's up, what's up, what's up? Happy New Year. I know it's February 22nd. I know that. But I haven't been around in 2021 to see you. So welcome back, Facebook Live. Welcome back, uh, Impact and our real community. It's good to see you. And with some sobriety, I really want to say uh, share with you some uh, some thoughts about life. Today, we uh, heard some tragic news that um, since we started this, this whole thing of real talk with our community, uh, and we started because of this pandemic, as of today, we've reached over a half a million people who have died from this awful, tragic virus and disease. And so, um, you know, it, it, I think we should just have a moment of silence and a moment of, of quiet because this, this, this is something that is affecting communities all across the country, specifically many of our black communities. Are, we've lost daughters and sons and nephews and cousins and mothers and fathers and grandparents. So why don't we, for this moment, just take for 10 seconds a moment of silence. Okay, now uh, I also want to say a couple of things before I introduce our guests. And tonight we got something different. We don't have a panel, we got one guy. And I'm really excited about this. But tomorrow, mark your calendars, it's February 23rd. And 20, February 23rd is the one year anniversary of when Ahmaud Arbery was killed. I know last year became very popular in March when we finally got the videos released. But prior to that, he was killed in February. And so tomorrow is a day that if you could walk some steps for Ahmad Arbery, like he went running that day. Uh, and let's let's keep keep that in mind. Well, now I want to introduce to you Dr. Andre Johnson. He is a pastor, but he's a professor at the University of Memphis. He uh, is in Memphis now. We're not going to talk about ribs, Doc. We're going to get to that at the as uh, I'm hungry and I'm thinking about some ribs right now. So oh Lord. <laughs> but uh, Dr. Johnson is here because of a couple of reasons. He's a professor in communications and he's a pastor, but he is also an author of a book that I'm reading called No Future in This Country, The Prophetic Pessimism of Henry McNeil Turner. Now, if you, if you don't know this, he's also the director of the Henry McNeil Turner mm -hmm. Institute. And so mm -hmm. just to start off for a little bit, why don't you just before we get into this guy, because what we want to do, we want to do something different from Black History Month. Mm -hmm. Yesterday was the 56th anniversary of Malcolm. But we talk about Malcolm all of the time. And I don't want to get rid of him. I want him to stay on the bookshelf. But there's a lot of people like this guy, Henry McNeil Turner, that these people need to know. But tell me, what does it, tell me, how did this institute come to be? Let's start with that before we delve into the book. Well, well, first of all, let me just say thank you uh, for the invitation to be here, Brother Jimmy. And a shout out um, to your communication um, um, director, Kayla. She was very, very helpful to me, um, getting me set up here. And uh, I am so grateful and thankful for her and her ministry as well. And to the Impact Movement family, thank you for allowing me an opportunity to come and to talk about Bishop Henry McNeil Turner and about whatever else we're gonna talk about on today. Uh, it is um, um, funny that you should mention uh, Malcolm on, on yesterday, his death, uh, and um, because Bishop Turner in many, many ways uh, foreshadowed Malcolm X, uh, and we can get into that a little bit later, but. Uh, about the Henry McNeil Turner project in which you asked about. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to do uh, when I discovered Turner, and we can talk about how I got around to doing that, uh, when I was in grad school, is when I discovered the wealth of writings that Turner produced hmm. in the 19th century. I mean, just an overabundance. The man wrote um, just like weekly, and um, he would be akin to a blogger or someone who wrote a weekly column um, each and every week. Uh, he wrote so much. And one of the things that I knew I wanted to do when I graduated was to curate these mm -hmm. writings because 
They were just out there in plain sight in the Christian Recorder newspaper, in other newspapers of the day, uh, in some journals, uh, book chapters, uh, some introductions to books, some interviews. I mean, that was just out in plain sight. So one of the things that I wanted to do, Brother Jimmy, is to curate them, collect them all, curate them, and um, and then decided to upload them on a website. Um, shout out to Dr. Foreman, uh, Gabrielle Foreman, for helping me see uh, the importance of the Digital Humanities Project. Uh, but when I decided to do that, and when I decided to collect these um, writings uh, in book form, as well as in a digital humanities format, I wanted the world to see and read and to, and just like I did when I first laid eyes on them, and to really just treasure um, these writings um, that Bishop Henry McNeil Turner wrote uh, back in the 19th century, writings that still are relevant uh, today. And so the institute, how how old is the institute? No, no, it's a project. It's a, it's a project. It's a sorry, project. It's a digital humanities project, and it is four years uh, old, um, maybe five. I think technically I started in twenty sixteen, so we're coming up on the fifth year uh, of, of that. And a little bit later on this spring, we will be releasing some more writings. Uh, and um, some of the writings from the Voice of Mission newspaper that he edited from 1893 to 1900. So stay tuned for that. There will be a big announcement uh, when that's about to come out a little bit later on this spring. Well, all right. So let's let's get these guys to unpack because there's some <laughs> parts of here I want to get an idea of who Turner was. Because right. unlike W. B. Du Bois, most people don't realize he was born after slavery. And then Booker T was born a few years mm -hmm. before slavery, slavery was gone. Mm -hmm. But really, this guy was not that uh, he was around before slavery ended. Mm. Tell, tell us a little bit about this dude. Well, Bishop Henry McNeil Turner was born February the 1st, 1834 in Newberry Court uh, House, South Carolina. Uh, and um, you're right. He was born uh, while slavery was going on, but he was born free. And the reason why he was born free, family legend had it that his um, grandfather was captured in Africa uh, and unbeknownst to these captors that he somehow was an African prince of some tribe. And the story goes that... Uh, and, and this is just family lore. This is what Turner shared with everybody who asked him. Um, um, the family lore said that um, royal blood could not be enslaved. So they had to let him go. But they let him go and he ended up in South Carolina and the rest is history, as they say. So um, Turner is born while slavery is going on. Turner is working alongside enslaved folk. He uh gets hired out over and over again and again to different folk to work alongside uh enslaved folk to earn meager wages and one of the things that um that you know back then that people did to even the folk who were not enslaved mm -hmm. but who were just apprentices or or workers or servants or you know um they try to treat treat them just as harshly, of course, as they treat the enslaved people. And, and so that's why Turner had to get, keep getting hired out because he kept running away. He kept saying, I don't want to do this anymore. So he had multiple different jobs until he found this one job that he would argue and say was fortuitous in his upbringing because when he became a um, cleanup person, um, um, if you will, in a office, uh, a lawyer's office. The lawyers there um, allowed him to read, allowed him to ask questions, allow him to engage because they were appreciative of his memory. Turner, you could tell Turner something once and he could remember it almost verbatim. And he was just had that gift. And that gift helped him with his oratory and his rhetoric. It helped spur him into becoming the first 
um, um, uh, one of the first African-American um, um, chaplains uh, in the armed forces. It also um, inspired him, of course, to do the things that he did in order to become a bishop and the rest, as they say, is history. So um, I skipped a whole lot, but Turner is this fascinating figure growing up around enslaved folk, hanging out, matter of fact, learning a lot from them. And it shaped his whole education. It shaped his uh, rhetorical education. And it made him the person that he ended up being uh, a little bit later on. Now, one of the things that people, because you're saying he was a precocious guy, right? Yeah. I mean, he just, he not only memorized, he just had to read insensibly. Yeah. Yeah. But one of the things that I, I think we forget. And he taught himself, so, by the way, Brother Jimmy. Oh, he taught himself how to read. Let me, let me just say this. He taught himself. Uh, um, how to read and write, and then by the by the time he was finished, not only could he read and write in English, but he knew Hebrew, he knew Greek, and he knew Latin. <laughs> He's a bad boy. <laughs> but see, but see, some of the things I'm concerned about with our Black history, they only let us see a mm -hmm. couple of these people out of slavery. Fred mm -hmm. Douglas, as you know, the great orator and the great liberator. We get Sojourner right. Truth and Harriet Tubman. But this dude, like you said, he was a chaplain in the army and he comes out and he eventually becomes a part of the AME church. Yes. Right. And those are the earlier days of the AME church. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, he eventually becomes the 12th bishop of the uh, AME church. Hey, check this out, though. This is how he becomes uh, part of the AME church. He first starts off as a licensed minister in the um, Methodist Episcopal Church South. Right. Now, now, now figure that. This is the the, the, uh, uh, the church that uh, supported enslaved, enslaved folks. So he becomes this, this minister there. And a and, um, and matter of fact, I'm actually looking at some of the early writings when he talks about uh, that period of his life. It's very fascinating of how he... Um, shows support to the ministers who helped groom him um, when he was a United, I mean, not United, but a Methodist Episcopal South minister, um, traveled around the South doing revivals. Uh, of course, he had to have a white minister go with him, you know, exactly. but he's doing all the preaching. He's doing all of the revivals. Uh, people are coming. People are uh, being led to Christ. People are enjoying his preaching. He preaches at um, the University of Georgia. He goes to Athens. He goes in Alabama. Then he finally gets to Louisiana, where he meets uh, an AME minister. And this AME minister begins to tell him about uh, uh, the AME church. And not so long after that, when he found out that there was a black church where people not only was licensed, but they were ordained. That's right. And that's the other thing about the Methodist Church South. Turner was licensed, but he couldn't be ordained. And that meant he could never become a bishop or an elder or any of that. So he's listening to this AME minister tell him about the AME church. And he said, like, no, I like this. So he eventually joins the AME church and then gets to Baltimore in 1859 and then D.C. in 1860. And he begins to do his work there in the AME church. And the AME church for him is this new space and place for liberty and liberative church work, work that he could not do or ever could do in the Methodist Episcopal South Church. Now, see, this is very important for our audience <laughs> because we need to spell out because some of these folk come from evangelical roots. Yes. So it's never a question about uh, Bishop Turner's commitment to Jesus. Right. But it's also the idea mm -hmm. that the racism in the land mm -hmm. keeps him restricted in his activity to be mm -hmm. fully who he needs to be. Is that correct? You're preaching right there. <laughs> so so right. I need people to see that. So, and no. this seems like to be a journey within the Christian world, right? right? Exactly. It exactly. seems like January 2020 is being spoken about in 1860. Is that uh, correct? 
And so, so you're absolutely right. He is limited. And, and the reason why I started off by saying he goes and do, does these revivals and he's successful at it. He's raising money for the church. He's doing all of the things that you will check off as being successful. Even here's a story. One white parishioner uh, in a church thought that Turner preached too well for a black person. Uh oh. And he said, you just memorize your sermons. You cannot speak extemporaneously. And Turner took the bet and said, I can show you. He said, I will give you a text. He gave him Genesis 7 and 1, talking Shut about uh, uh, coming out of the ark. Uh, and, and, and Turner took that text, uh, Genesis 7 and 1, and expound on it so brilliantly that the report said that not only was the man satisfied, but the crowd shouted and $810 was raised that night. <laughs> a large sum of money in 1856 or 57 or whenever it was. So the, the, the point is that you're absolutely right that Turner is doing the work, but not being fully appreciated, not for his gifts, but for who he was. That's right. For the humanity of it. And he did not know it back then. But that really propels him eventually to be the person that he became. And he drew upon that as he kept on going and, be and began to understand that this is more than just surface stuff. This goes to who I am as a person. So when he begins to re-examine his own theological outlook, I know we'll get to that, but when he begins to reorganize and rethink his own theological positioning, he draws upon his life experiences. Hmm. And he says to himself, like, wait a minute, God, you, you have to mean, uh, you, you have to have created me to do more than this. And so he, he begins that journey. You're absolutely right. So let's let's begin to talk through this idea. So first, let me just announce to everybody. I want to announce it first because they can get this book, No Future, in this country for yeah. discount. Now I didn't pay That's discount. Right. I got the full price. It's thirty percent <laughs> off right now. Is that correct? There is right now. If you go to the University Press of Mississippi's webpage where the book is published uh, right now for Black History Month. And, and I told them, I said, listen, I said, uh, press, I am doing the Impact Movement show with Brother Jimmy McGee, and we need a discount. And they said, okay. So when I mentioned your name, <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> no, 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 then they no, said, okay. In Black History Month, they're doing an awesome thing. Um, some of the books are 30% off, especially the ones that, that um, centers... Uh, that talks a little bit about black history. So instead of $30 for the paperback, you can get it for $21 right now. So if you go and do that, or uh, if you email me, um, um, if you want a signed copy, we can arrange that as well too, but we can talk about that a little bit later as well. So that's, right. that's, that's right. it. But I want, yeah. I want people to get this book. So what people fail to realize, and I think there's no imagination to it, is that this man was also, besides a bishop and I mean, he was a prophet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he had a prophetic mm -hmm. utterance. So yes. let's talk about as someone who is introducing people to Jesus, he knows the text, he knows Hebrew and Greek, he mm -hmm. can he can preach any text he wants, but let's talk about his dissatisfaction with the way the country was dealing with race. Now, My how God. much how much did that bother him? Even though he's a part of a black denomination, yeah. and a black church, how much did that bother him? To this one world? of the things that I that I did in my first book, I've written two books on Bishop Turner. The first book was a revised version of my dissertation, um, the Forgotten Prophet, uh, Bishop Henry McNeil Turner and the African American Prophetic Tradition. And speaking about that question, Brother Jimmy, I. Uh, looked at that. And what I wanted to, I noticed something in my study of Bishop Turner. I noticed that early on in his career, um, in his AME career, uh, especially after the Civil War, 
And I know I don't know if we're going to have time to really talk about the theological understanding and meanings about the Civil War. Uh, but for Black people, that was a God thing. That was a God movement. Matter of fact, that was the only way that slavery was going to end. Slavery was not going to end with a persuasive argument. It was had to end. Black people believe in bloodshed, and they believe that that was an apocalyptic moment, uh, prophetically, uh, and then that God has ushered in a new day. So Turner believed that as well. So my 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 understanding of Turner had me to question: How in the world? does someone go from an optimistic prophet, which I called him that, early on, 1866, let bygones be bygones. Let us work with the whites. Let us be brothers and yes. sisters in Christ and love each other. Let us not hold nothing against them. I mean, it was the, 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 the uh, move that's going on right now. Let us just move on. Let us forget about January the 6th. Let us forget about what happened the last four years. Let us just move on and work hand in hand and let us forgive everybody to a pessimistic prophet, 1895. There is no future in this country for black folk. Wow. So my the whole move was like, I mean, question was like, how do you move from here to there? And what happened was, of course, the context and how racism, white supremacy, how the promises of reconstruction That's right. failed time and time and time again, how for Turner, the Supreme Court, and this is what I talk about in the new book. So when I get to prophetic pessimism, I talk about, okay, here are six examples. I give six chapters, six examples of Turner's pessimism. Because the last 20 years of his life, um, and you can make an argument the last 30, but the last 20 for sure, he is so pessimistic about the country as it relates to race that the country would never get right on race. And so from Plessy v. Ferguson to the Spanish-American War to God is a Negro to the election of 1900 to his whole immigration impulse to uh, call him the flag a dirty and contemptible rag. Turner is understanding that race is the center, has always been, race and racism has always been the center of the problems in this country. And until you deal with that, Turner is arguing that nothing would change. Hmm. And nothing did change in his life, as far as he was concerned, because he dies May 8th. 1915, at the height of white nationalism and white supremacy. And so, and so what, what you're talking about, what they, if they continue to read, when he got elected to the Georgia State of Representatives, they right. wouldn't even let him go in there. Is what? that correct? Well, this is 1868, right? So 1866, he is saying, let bygones be bygones. 1867, he's working on the Georgia State um, um, constitutional convention because Georgia got to do a new constitution in order to become a state again. So he's on, he's in the room making these changes and, and shaping the constitution. And the biggest mistake, and he writes about it, he said, the biggest mistake I made was not putting in the constitution that black folk could hold office. I was convinced wow. that I didn't need to do that by my white counterparts who told me that, hey, the 14th Amendment took care of that for you. And that's exactly what they hit him on when he becomes, in 1868, when he became a state rep, him and the other 32 um, representatives, both in the House and the Senate of Georgia. So now, go back to the Georgia uh, election um, just a month, a month and a half. On oh, January 5th. Exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at that race and looking at Turner and reading some Turner stuff. And I'm like, oh man, it's the same thing. So the, the, the point is that Turner is so conciliatory. He is so open. He wants this thing to work so badly. So when they had an opportunity, for instance, to bring um, the Confederates up on treason charges and say, 
and ban them from ever running or holding office ever again. Turner was against that. They had it in their power to do. They talked about it. Turner's like, no, I think they've learned their lesson. Let them come on back and they can work with us. And as soon as they got in power, they kicked them out. That's right. Now he eventually gets back in because that's when the federal government comes in and um, threatens Georgia with kicking them out again and, and, all, and a whole lot of stuff. But by 1870, 1872, Georgia is, quote, redeemed, as the white conservatives uh, talked about. And you don't get another um, black in the Georgia uh, legislature, I don't think, until Julian Bond. To Julius Bond in the 18 in 1960s, when right, he's no, a I'm, young man out of Morehouse. You're right. I mean, you, you, you. I mean, so I'm looking at this moment in time right now with the bunch of people talking about let us forgive and forget, let us move on, let us not hold anybody accountable. Let's just move on and 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 work together. And I'm listening to these arguments, and I'm reading the same type of arguments Turner and other people made back in 1866, 1867, and up to 1868 until he got kicked out. And he gave that wonderful speech uh, from the floor. Uh, I claim the, the rights as a man. Um, and he delivered a prophetic speech for the ages where he warned them, you know, uh, you may expel us, gentlemen, with your votes, but God is watching. Hmm. And then I can just see he probably waved his finger, woe unto you. <laughs> but, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, so Turner is like that early. And so that's why he is so pessimistic, because he saw an opportunity. The country really had an opportunity for everybody that's out there that's work that that want us to uh, let bygones be bygones and let's work hard and let's move forward. The country really had an opportunity for a multiracial democracy during Reconstruction. Really had an opportunity to do that, and the country said, "No, nah, we don't want to do that." See, and then there we, we lose it, and we lose it. And we lose it, and we still paying for it today. And and we have these moments over and over again. I think it's important for mm -hmm. people to realize how significant the black church was to the liberty of black people. Because we're talking about when you're talking about Turner, we're talking about in his lifetime three periods: slavery, Reconstruction, right. Jim Crow. You're right. So so he sees all three. Now let's let's touch on this piece because this is controversial, and everybody wants to know a little bit about this. So mm -hmm. everyone gets upset, especially in the evangelical world, about James Cone and black liberal theology and mm -hmm. black theology. Yeah. And, and now that Cone, you know, bless his heart, he's with the Lord. He's been gone. What it's been. He died February three years ago. I think three years mm -hmm. ago, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Something like that. But let's yeah. talk about this important part in the book. But that came out that that McNeil Turner said, God is yeah. a Negro. Yep. Yeah, let's let's talk about that because that's pre James Cone. Everybody thought yep. Cone brought that in. Cone didn't bring that in. <laughs> Cone inherited that. Am I right? Yep. Yeah. Um, shout out to James Cone though for one being one of the only ones that I can find so far uh, in the literary record that credits Bishop Turner. Um, Turner foreshadowed many arguments and movements. Uh, one of the reasons why he's a fascinating study is that if you really want to understand the 20th century civil rights arguments, mm -hmm. you can study Bishop Turner because he's making those same arguments in the 19th century. But right. but James Cone is one of the ones who did mention that, you know, when he read Bishop Turner's God is a Negro, it really inspired him to do more work in that area. And that was about it. It wasn't um, an analysis or anything. It's just a nod that, hey, I have read this person. I've, read, I've heard of this person. But yeah, Bishop Turner, 1895, October 27th, to be exact, 1895, speaking at the first gathering of what we're now 
uh, what we now know as the National Baptist Convention. He delivers the sermon uh, where he says, uh, Negroes should worship a Negro God. I worship a Negro God. God is a Negro. Or oh, I worship a Negro God. God pe Negroes should worship a Negro God. God is a Negro. And so that sent shockwaves uh, to people now. Two years prior, he already told people at the Chicago World's Fair that Adam and Eve, the first uh, man and woman, biblically speaking, uh, on the planet, were black. And he's already doing that work. So he just takes it up a notch two years later when God is a Negro. So nobody should be surprised. Most folk enjoyed it and liked it and and but a whole lot of other folk were uncomfortable with it. And I'm not talking about white folk. We're talking about black folk. Exactly. Black folk, and I, and I chronicled this in the book, black folk um, was like, Turner Wright is, is, is you know, writing that one black person, one black preacher came up to him after the sermon and whispered in his ear, are you afraid that God is gonna be angry with you for calling him a Negro? Come on, man. <laughs> Bro, I'm just telling you, is that not today? I don't Ooh, know if there's not today. Yes, that's today. I, I, I don't know. I, 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 many of the folk I traveled around in those circles, they, they, they have a little better understanding. But yeah, I, I from the stuff I've seen on social media. <laughs> but, but, but another person said, if I died and go to heaven, and I see all black folk there, I will get my hat and I will leave. Oh, this, wow. so, so Turner is also highlighting something else with his God as a Negro, because God, God as a Negro is actually a, a affirmation, self-affirmation sermon. It is. All he is trying to say is that if you are going to believe in God, and if you don't believe that God looks like you, have your features, there is no hope in the world for you because that is the ultimate for people of faith. And if God does not look like me, matter of fact, if God is angry because God made me, where is, I can't even appeal to anybody because God is the ultimate uh, barometer. And so Turner is trying to get people to understand, don't hate yourself. He writes about this. He writes about, you know, uh, don't hate your thick lips and your wide nose and your kinky hair. He hated when people talk about, oh, sister so-and-so got good hair or she got bad hair. See? He, he was like, that's dumb. He don't say that because what you're saying is that, first of all, you're buying into white supremacy, white nationalism, all that, but you're also saying something about God. You're saying that God has made a mistake and that God has made a mistake, not on a mistake, but on you. And if you are a mistake, where is the hope for you? And that's why some black ministers used to preach, Brother Jimmy, and Turner talked about these folk, talking about preachers getting into pulpits, preaching about when they die. Uh, they'll be glad when their bodies turn white. Wow. He called them fool Negroes, scullions bootlickers, and just uh, contemptible asses. That's wow. what he called them. And wow. he said that they they have <laughs> one, one letter, he said they, you, people would be better off hearing a dog wail than listening to some of these preachers preach. Wow. And so his God as a Negro is this affirmation. Now, a lot of black people got with it, though. A lot of black people say, yeah, that makes sense. And they affirm. And then all of a sudden, in the 19, late 20s and 30s, there was another person coming uh, up to New York. Yes. They were talking about a black guy. That's right. And so you That's get. Right. <laughs> You're right. You get Marcus Garvey, right? Talking about a black guy, talking about going back to Africa, talking about all of these things. And you don't get the connection to Turner because I can't find anywhere in Garvey's writings where he makes a direct 
statement about Turner like Cone did. But I did find that a couple of the women folk who used to work with Turner after Turner passed in 1915. Matter of fact, Garvey comes to America in 1915 looking for Booker T. Washington because he read Up From Slavery and he thought that that was, he, he read that book and said that's the book that he wants to build his life around. He ends up looking for Washington, but ended up being more like Turner. <laughs> so, exactly. So, exactly. so women that used to work with Turner now I found I discovered worked with Garvey. And I guarantee you that's the connection. I believe that many of those uh, um, many of those women told him about Bishop Turner and some of his writings, and that's where he got missed this from. But I got to I got to I got to find the link, and I haven't found that link yet. Well, um, you know, as I, as I listened to you though, I started thinking about Malcolm and his yep. whole journey, journey, because yep. he was an optimist that turned pessimist. Mm -hmm. His parents were Marcus Garveyites, but I wonder what would have happened in his life if he would have had captured or listened or mm -hmm. read a sermon by Bishop McNeil Turner. Right. Because oh, what? Because mm -hmm. his understanding of black pastors were that as black pastors, that we affirm white supremacy, that we were passive. This was not this dude. He was not like that at all. Not in thought and not in psyche. Is that correct? Right. right. No, no, no. And uh, so let me, let me go just a step further. You mentioned Marcus, I mean, Malcolm X. And in 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 the uh, hooking up with Garvey and the parents and all that's and you know Malcolm's uh, dad was a preacher, Baptist preacher, minister, exactly. and all that. So um, how would Malcolm X been? Well, maybe he'd been like A. Philip Randolph because A. Philip Randolph sat under his father, who was a good friend of who Bishop Turner. He loved Bishop Turner. He talked. To A. Philip Randolph's father talked to A. Phil, Luf A. Philip about this Bishop Turner fella. He takes what he learns from his dad about organizing and about getting folk together. And he's learning this. What? Where? From Bishop Turner through his daddy. Wow. So he would have seen, he would have uh, um, um, seen Bishop Turner. I think. If I'm not mistaken, he um, I grew up in Florida. So Turner is traveling. Turner goes to um, probably the house, have dinner or whatever. They talking about stuff. And then he's listening to all of this. So yes, could be. I don't know. He is sitting and listening to his father go on and on about a man that he truly admired and how he organized literally organized the AME Church in the South, literally uh, um, built, built the AME Church in the South and, and all of its ministers, and uh, then went to Africa and planted the church and helped planted the church there in Africa. Talk about so, organizing. <laughs> so we, we need to connect the dots for who people, so people can follow us. A. Yeah. Philip Randolph, was the head of the sleeping porters. Is that correct? Yep. yep. And when we talk about the March on Washington, he was the leader of the March on Washington where Dr. King would eventually say, I have a dream. A. Philip Randolph was over that. Now, Bayard Rustin was the, yep. the operations director, but yep. the head of that was A. Philip Randolph. Oh, a. Philip Randolph wanted to do it earlier. He wanted, he wanted to, to do it. it. He wanted to do it under FDR, if I remember correctly. Is that correct? And by the time they did it, he's the senior statesman. That's right. And he is like, you know, hey, you young guys, y'all handle it now. I'm just glad it's getting done. You know, whatever I can do to help. And so you're absolutely right. So you can make these connections. Bishop Turner, and this is why Bishop Turner is so fascinating. Again, you said it earlier. He lives during slavery times. Civil War, Reconstruction. Jim Crow, post Reconstruction, Jim Crow, turn of the century, all of those things. He's the the um, um, the imperialism, the industrial age, the Gilded Age, you know, where all of the folk were making these big time monies and stuff like that. He's living through all of this, and he, like I say, he dies in 1915 at the height 
of white nationalism because that same year, the movie Birth of a Nation comes out. It's, it's, it's um, shown in the White House and the president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson said it was like history written in lightning, lightning. And this was the best film ever. Gave it its presidential seal and here we are. And all of a sudden, all of the stuff that Turner was trying to tell folk what was going to happen, lynchings going on abated, um, 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 the convict list, list blah, 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 tongue tied, the convict lease system really cranking up, the whole notion of sharecropping and never getting out of debt. Turner is privy to all of this, and he's talking about this to his dying day. He's talking about it where other black folks are talking about, look at all the stuff we have acquired. Look at what, and, and, and yeah, okay. You know, you move from slavery and you got your churches and your schools and your businesses. But at the same time, you're still you a second class, class citizen. citizen. That's right. You get shut down and nothing you can do. Uh, we, we are very familiar with the 1895 speech of uh, Booker T. Washington, the Atlanta Compromise speech. After that speech, Turner wrote in the newspaper the next day, Mr. Washington will have to live a long time to undo the damage he did to our race in that one speech. Wow. And so, of course, the whole notion of social equality was fake to begin with, and Turner exposed it. How can you have separate but equal anything? If you are out of social touch, you are out of economic touch, educational touch, business touch, every touch. You have to work together. And since white people would not work with black folk, we should pick up and go to Africa. That's Turner. <laughs> See, so so he's a Pan African, and he's a Black Lives Matter guy. Now I know we got an audience <laughs> here because I can see people listening. So I want to uh, give room for people to ask questions. So if you are watching right now, please type in a question on Facebook Live. I know you're on YouTube as well. And Kayla, excuse me, our our, our producer will get it to us so we can ask his question. So please, if you got a question, ask now. We're going to be on for another fifteen minutes or so. But I got a follow up question to ask. To, to, to ask him because, so Dr. Johnson, the, the one thing I want to make sure people understand, unfortunately, like when we look at the civil rights movement, we, we highlight one or two people. We highlight Malcolm or Martin, maybe Thurgood Marshall, to think it's just the civil rights movement is about these one or two individuals. Mm -hmm. But McNeil Turner was not the only pastor that thought this way. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. There's a guy called Henry Highland, Highland Garnett, mm -hmm. too. Am I correct? So he they, has other peers too, is that correct? They would be contemporaries. Yes, they would be contemporaries um, a little bit. Garnett is a little bit older um, than um, Turner. He would be more of a Douglas contemporary, but Garnett, um, um, uh, Edward Blyden, um, and, and others would be proper contemporaries excuse me, contemporary returner. And let me just add this, though, when we're speaking about contemporaries. You know who else is a contemporary returner? Francis L. Watkins Hopper. Uh, really? It's a journal of truth. Um, Ida B. Wells. Turner loved Ida B. Wells. Now, Turner was senior to Ida B. Wells, but when Ida B. Wells started talking about lynching and, 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 and all, Turner was supportive. He wow. thought that that was the best thing going. Um, uh, Nanny Burroughs would be a contemporary. So, and the reason why I'm bringing up women is because Turner was also as 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 much, and I'm always careful when I say this, as much as you could be as a 19th century black male pastor in that context, Turner was pro-woman. And what I mean by pro-woman, I'm just not talking about you know, liking women. I'm talking about pro woman in 1868 when he was in the state legislature. When he got back in, he issued the first bill for women to.
to vote in Georgia in 1889. Never got to the floor, but the fact that he, you know, issued the bill to try to get it there never got out of committee. Wow. Not only that, but would shout out women. And when I mean by shouting out women, I'm not just talking about saying Miss So and So cook a good meal, but no, uh, Mary Harden when she passed away. Mary Harden, uh, Sister Mary Harden, helped me with my sermons early on in my career. He's writing a eulogy for her in the Christian Recorder and talked about the times when she used to sit him down and work with his grammar and his framing of the sermons. And when everybody else said, good sermon, pastor, he used to dread coming to her because she'd be the last one with her hands folded saying, yeah, it was okay. <laughs> but useful for me to work on, but made him a better preacher. Not only that, he ordains the first woman in the AME church, Sarah Hughes, in 1885. The other bishops rescind that. He allows women to run, not wow. just work, but run his newspapers when he takes his trips across country or when he has to go to Africa when he went four different times, when he was running his own newspapers, he put women in charge as the guest editors um, for the newspapers. So when I'm talking about pro-woman, he thought that women not only could preach, but they can lead, they can pastor, they should have all the rights and privileges. He and Douglas would be kind of tit for tat on that, he thought that women should have all the rights and privileges that men have, especially as it relates to the church. And that was an uphill slog that he always had to push uphill trying to get other bishops. So what he does he do? He empowers them by helping them start their own women auxiliary clubs and groups wow. in the AME church. Wow. And they then have their own power and their own money to do the things that they wanted to do. And one of the things that they really wanted to do because they loved Bishop Turner was to help him do whatever he needed to do, his mission work to Africa and around the country. So Turner is not only um, smart in that way, but he's also looking at, this is another avenue for women to exert leadership abilities that eventually leads to, uh, which we talked, which we saw uh, recently on the Black Church special on PBS, which eventually leads Vastai McKenzie to become the first bishop uh, in the AME Church in 2000. Wow. wow. Well, we got a couple of questions from the audience. Let's, oh, let's okay. get one of them. One of them is from Max Anderson, I believe. Let's see. Here we go. Max Gregory Anderson. Could you speak oh. about his relationship to Aaron Bradley and Tunis Campbell? <laughs> yes. Aaron Bradley was probably the Malcolm X of the 1800s. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead, Doc. Bradley and Campbell was in the Senate while he was in the House. So, and they all got kicked out. And um, you're absolutely right about Aaron Bradley. Aaron Bradley was, was like, you know, uh, while Turner was trying to be conciliatory and trying to, you know, Find middle ground. Bradley was just just the firebrand, and he eventually um, gets kicked out, and then he uh, is brought he's brought up on some trumped up charges. Um, had to do some um, had to do time uh, in jail, but they were close. Matter of fact, I am um, looking at a um, speech now where Turner is advocating for Aaron Bradley. Um, you know, he's brought up, like I said, on these trumped up charges and Bradley, um, of course did not do what he was charged of. And, um, Turner is issuing this, this, this strong defense, uh, uh, for him and his friend and Tunis Campbell the same way. And, and so they were close, they were contemporaries, uh, and, um, they all were part of the 33 the 33 that was kicked out of the Georgia uh, uh, legislator at the time. And so these are forerunners. And I wanted to also add, when I uh, want to go back to something, Brother Jimmy, you said since they're bringing up Bradley and, and Campbell, think about the civil rights movement. When we think about the movement, 
civil rights, human rights movement. Think about people as well, too. Think about all of the people, the people who are doing their own little part, That's who right. may hear a speech from Turner as he was coming through. But Turner's gone now. He goes to the next town. But I got that inside of me. And I'm just, you know, I'm not traveling like Turner. I'm not a bishop or I'm not even a state rep or I'm not even, I may not even be a licensed minister. But, you know, I'm just going to get my little group of people and I'm going to start talking about what we need to talk about as it relates to voting, as it relates to economics, as it relates to um, getting our fair share, um, voting, all of those type of things. So when they're coming through and when they're building, uh, they're building a network of people that are doing, and a lot of these folk were women that were doing this work. And so we just, I, every time I talk about Turner, every time I talk about civil rights movement, uh, social movements in general, I always want to bring up the people and uh, because the people make, without the people, there is no movement. I can be as eloquent as, as I want to be. And if nobody is, you know, agreeing with me or even hearing me, um, there is no movement. People listen to these words and they take them to heart and they go and try to implement them. See, and see, now you're talking about the impact movement because that's exactly what we want to be. We yeah. want to be a movement of people, not mm -hmm. just people connected to an icon. Okay. Exactly. Now we got one more question and then I All have right. a final question for you. Yeah, sure. I got time. Here we go. J.D. Harper has a question. He said, did Bishop Turner mm -hmm. ever cite any influences of African traditional religions? That's my frat brother too, by the way. Hey, J.D. Harper. <laughs> 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 go mom. Um, um, uh, not in a traditional sense. However, he does talk about, let me put it this way, in the, in the 1890s, he begins, as I was saying, begins to explore his theological understanding. So he starts hanging out with spiritualists, spiritualists who were, um, for lack of a better term, doing seances, um, were um, speaking to the dead, were praying, uh, meditating out in the woods. And some of that, when you read it and read what Turner was participating in, because he, and, and part of this was because Turner was grieving the death of his wife. His wife died, his first wife died in 88 or 89. And um, he writes about her death so poignantly um, when she died and then on the year anniversary of her death, he writes this beautiful, beautiful um, um, essay about her and how much he loves her and misses her and stuff. And when you read it, you can really feel his anger. I mean, anguish and, and pain and suffering. And so he gets with the spiritualists and they begin to um, talk to his wife and talk to uh, his grandparents and 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 he begins to have this, he writes about this peace and this calmness and all of, 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 of these emotions. And when you read when Turner is writing about, it sounds eerily familiar to African traditional religions. Mm -hmm. It sounds um, um, like libations, pouring libations to the end uh, in remembrance of the ancestors. So, um, though he does not talk about it in the way that we will understand it today. Uh, there are some elements um, that I have read so far. And when I get through with all of the readings, I probably will even discover some more. But good question, though. But good question. And, and he would not, has... I don't think he would have been afraid, though, to delve into that if he would have found it to be helpful. The whole God is a Negro piece was his recognition of the blackness of God and that God is God's self, a rhetorical construction made by humans to better understand God and to live according to the purposes of God. And Turner's argument is there is, hey, if you cannot see or believe that God looks like you, um, 
not only looks like you, but loves you, then there is no hope. Well, see, so, to, so this leads to my next question to you, because uh -huh. we're talking about a man, you said born 1834, he dies yeah. 1919. Today's world, we're talking even more, although the language, if you continue, you can see writings about white supremacy. But today we're talking a lot about white supremacy. And in mm -hmm. impact, we've been talking about a decolonized thought yeah. or decolonized mind. This man had one. So right. help me help me to unpack how a, how a guy who grew up uh, in 1834 to 1919 has a decolonized mind in that era. Listen, I can give you a, a I think, a good scholarly answer based upon my readings. I can tell you that his arguments about immigration, when he understand, I mean, understood that black folk would not immigrate, he began to go deeper in his faith and he begins to go deeper uh, into understanding about race and racism. And it allowed him to have this philosophical outlook uh, that was poignant because with God being black and at the center and it was all about agency, I can talk about that, but brother Jimmy, you asked the, the, the $1 million question and the $1 million question is how can you have this liberating mind when you are surrounded by all this white supremacy and oppression? That's right. And so isn't it amazing how God can work? Hmm. <laughs> the spirit can still speak even when everybody else is telling you that you're nothing and nobody. The spirit can still open up avenues for you to see something beyond yourself. And this reminded me, or reminds me of, um, of a Sojourner Truth um, 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 journey. Uh, when she's Il Isabella Bumfrey, and when she somehow discovers God in the woods as being bigger than anything that she could ever imagine. All her life, she was just told that she was a slave and she was going to be enslaved for the rest of her life. But on one, one day, she just got up and started walking and got to freedom, changed her name, Sojourner Truth. Where did all that come from? I don't, I don't know. She wasn't in a seminary. She wasn't in a university setting. She didn't read any of the uh, decolonization no books, decolonized books that we read. She wasn't reading critical race theory. She wasn't reading any of that. So where did all this come from? So the point I'm just trying to make is, is that if we are open to spirit, then maybe the spirit can teach us and open us and address us in such a way that we can still see even if everything else around us is messed up. And Turner does that and tries to bring everybody to that point using what? Agency. He wholeheartedly believe, and that's the difference between prophetic pessimism and Afro-pessimism. Afro-pessimism speaks of no agency. Prophetic pessimism believes that the person still has agency, agency to believe or not to believe, agency to do, and he was trying to get people to do for themselves. The same arguments you hear with the uh, Nation of Islam and Black Power Advocates, that were doing in the 50s and 60s. Turner is doing this in 1890. His action was to get up and move to Africa, to immigrate to Africa. And when he realizes that money is a problem, ships are a problem, you can't get over there. The spirit of agency, however, stayed in those Southern people. How do we know this? We know this by the Great Migration one and two because black people did leave the South. That's right. And what I am, what I have argued before when people talk about his failed strategies of immigration, I'm like, okay, but what if 1 million people left the South in 1890? How would Africa be? That's How right. would America be? That's right. 
I mean, so when you can't fight and win, and when you should not submit because what he called that is uh, that would beget degradation upon degradation to your children and your grandchildren ad nauseum. So he thought that was Booker T. Washington's idea. Just assimilate and just, you know, don't say anything. Just be quiet about your lot in life. He offers a third way. He says resist by not participating. Leave. Wow. But you can't leave because of the money situation. So what black people did, the second or third best thing, wherever their money could take them. If you was in Louisiana, you probably got as far as Mississippi. If you're in Mississippi, you got as far as Memphis. You came on Beale Street. If you're far as Memphis, you made it up to St. Louis, St. Louis, Chicago, Chicago, Detroit, Detroit, the exactly. Canada. I mean, you know, you try to get out wherever you can because you believe that I can do something now. I don't have to wait on the quote white person, white man at that time to tell me or to show me or to give me anything I can do. And I'm, I, I, and I, and I am going to do by proving this. And black people did do that. Of course, until white people came and burned down, burned down their houses or lynch houses, businesses and stuff. Well, I got a couple more questions. First of all, do oh. you know Alessio Avalon? I do not. Well, I somebody am... wants us to say happy birthday to him. So happy <laughs> birthday to Alessio. Uh, we, yeah. we don't know who you are. But here's the last part of the imagination of Bishop McNeil Turner. And then we, we're going to go. But before I say this last question, let me remind people. One, we're going to post uh, all on uh, the Impact website all of the articles that Dr. Johnson has been writing about McNeil Turner. So you're going to get links to all of those. Secondly, most importantly, I got my book for $30. But right now, throughout Black History Month, if you go to Mississippi Press, you can get it for 30% off. And you can read mm -hmm. more about No Future in This Country, The Prophetic Pessimism of Bishop Henry McNeil Turner. So please, you can go to both, both spots. You can pick up your book. It's only good for Black History Month, so they got a week to get it done. Is that right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. If you so want the 30% off now. If you want the 30%, but yeah. you can get the book afterwards. He still gets the money. Yeah, but right. uh, go ahead. So here's my last question. Because some people give the idea of separating the reality to spirit and secular. And so the idea that McNeil's understanding of church was just church in itself as the hours that he preached. Give an idea of the imagination, especially when you're talking about this pessimism and what you've been saying, that his imagination about what it meant to know God was bigger than Sunday morning or four hours with four oh walls God. in the church. Is that correct? Oh my God. I mean, what we know, what we do now, um, as far as outreach, as far as uh, ministries, abroad and as well as here at home, our understanding of the black church being uh, the center place for all activity, that, that whole concept. This is, this is what Turner would have agreed with, that, that the church is the place where you come to learn, not only about the Bible, but about civics, about politics, about voting, about what do you need to do in the community throughout the week in order to maintain, in order to make it back on Sunday uh, to come to worship. So his ecclesiology, if you will, is holistic in nature because God is holistic in nature. Shut up. There is no like separation <laughs> between sacred <laughs> and secular fraternal. So, so this whole notion of Turner being and 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 don't get me wrong now he had this is a debate going on in the AME church is going on in the Baptist church at this time as well too should ministers be in politics and you know and should ministers do all the things that they're doing well minister the ministers who advocated for political involvement to run for office or to support candidates that were that they thought were better the conditions of the people that they serve they saw God and they saw the faith as this holistic 
understanding. And with this holistic understanding of the faith that I just don't minister to the individual and the individual soul, but the person as a whole person that, you know, the old saying, uh, before I can tell you about Christ, if you're hungry, you might listen to me better if you got something to eat. <laughs> you know? So, mm -hmm. I mean, the whole person. So, yeah, Turner is advocating that early on. He's telling the ministers. So what do you have to be as a, 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 to be a holistic minister? What do you have to do? Well, not only do you have to preach and sing, that, that was foundational. And matter of fact, Turner said, if you can't preach, if you can't sing, you can't preach, and you can't preach, you can't sing. So, you know, but, uh, and see, I take issue with that, Bishop Turner, because, you know, if I start singing now, you'll lose viewers. But anyway, <laughs> uh, exactly. uh, uh, but I think I can preach just a little bit. But but the point is that Turner is saying, what do you need? I want you to be well-rounded as a minister. I want you to be real with read. Uh, and if you can't read, we're going to learn how. And so you can not, so you can lord it over folk and stuff, but so you can better lead the people and understand what's going on in your community. So you can go back to the people and say, this is what's going on. This is what's going on. Here's what I think we ought to do. What do you say? Be in community with the people. And that's Turner Ecclesiology, that everybody has a role to play and everybody he talks about, again, I bring up the women. He talks about how the stewardesses of the AME church are doing a marvelous job in going out and visiting um, the sick and shut in, what we call now the sick and shut in, and going out to visit some of the members and praying for the members and praying for the male members of that household as well, too, because he will make a connection between them and the uh, other deacons or elders are supposed to be doing that, but they weren't doing it, but the women folk were. So everybody in the church is a minister under Turner's understanding of what uh, church should be like and, um, and that God is everywhere wow. and that God leads and guides everywhere. And he is like early with that. Wow. And it begins to shape Again, it is shapes his whole outlook of life. Turner foundational is foundationally shaped by his faith wow. in doing the things that he was doing. So it seems like me, the Bishop Turner, he wouldn't be handcuffed by a pandemic at all. Oh. He'll be no. out there helping people all throughout in every aspect. I mean, and, and, and you know, you can say that he did that during the Civil War when he was a chaplain and was on the battlefields. And when the uh, battles were over, he writes about walking around the dead bodies, praying over uh, dying men, both Confederates and Union members. Um, he, he talked about how the Union, I mean, the Confederate um, soldiers eventually began to respect him, even though he was a Negro. Uh, they respect him. And... Um, and, you know, that's part of his, like, conciliatory uh, attitude, I believe. You know, he looked at that as a one-on-one, that, that, that relationship, that one-on-one -on -one relationship, but not looking at it for the totality. And he had to get to that point. The reason I like Turner, Turner, you can see Turner's growth as time goes on as well, too. So I brought up the Civil War is because... Um, there was a lot of reconstruction that had to happen in the South. Buildings were burned out, <laughs> churches were destroyed, whole lot of stuff had to be, you know, revamped. And Turner was right there in the middle of it. And when the times got tough, Turner did not flee. He did not leave. He didn't go to Cancun. I mean, he didn't go up north. Shut up. He did not. He, he did not. I didn't say that. He did not leave the people. He stayed right there in Atlanta, in the South, and took the same indignities that the people were taking, even though he was a bishop, even though he was Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, well-renowned scholar of the church, 
but he too had to ride in the back of the trains. He too had to ride in the back of the cars. He too could not go in certain restaurants. Wow. And he stayed right there. Could have easily Move gone on. anywhere, really, uh, that he really wanted to go. Um, Africa, he could have gone up north to Philadelphia, had it a little bit easier. Could have gone out of Mexico, Haiti, somewhere, anywhere, out west. But he stayed right there. And so he stayed with the people because he really honestly believed that he was, he eventually becomes the prophet for the poor and the downtrodden in the South, especially the sharecroppers and the people who, um, well, let's just, you know, say it forgotten. Even by some of the black elite who, who were up north, who were always giving advice to what the people of the South should do and turn over right. Why don't you come down here for a week and live with us? Wow. And so, you know, so much so that when he does, when he did die, 25,000 people came to his viewing. We got one last question and I want to make a comment. Uh, can you show that? I think this is one last question. Is this from Max? One more time, and then we're going to end our day. He says, was his moving and later dying in Canada mm -hmm. part of his pessimism? Now, that sounds Actually, a little bit like W.B. Du Bois. Yeah, 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 right. Um, his earlier, his earliest biographer, a guy named M.M. Uh, Ponton, he wrote a biography of Turner in 1917. He's an AME minister himself, a good friend of Turner, and he just wanted to write something uh, quick after he passed away so people would not forget about Turner. He always, I mean, he wrote, and he, and he said Turner always would, told him and others that he never wanted to die in this country. He wanted to die outside of this country. And so um, when he went to Canada for church business, he was, he was the, the bishop of the area. So he was going up for um, uh, a meeting, a conference, where, of course, when he got to Canada, he had the stroke and he passes away. Wow. And he passed away. And so the, 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 the story is, and everybody began to, you know, pick up on that. Yeah, Turner said he wasn't going to die here. So, you know, it's a God thing, Turner, you know, soon he got to uh, Canada, he passes on, he got off of American soil, but it, I don't think Turner planned on doing that as well too. So he wasn't escaping, he wasn't going away or whatever. And the boss wasn't either, you know, for that matter. Um, they just wouldn't let him back in. He tried to come uh, back. Yeah, that's true. They, they were crazy with him and ropes. You're right, you're right. But, you're right. Yeah. You're but right. no, 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 but, but the point is he did stay. I mean, you know, he, he's, true. and this, can I real quick? I'm glad you brought up the boys because the boys is a very interesting figure as well. Because in 1915, well, first of all, Turner is at the meeting in Atlanta, uh, right bef before the meeting um, at Niagara Falls and the start of the NAACP. He was at the first meeting with the boys and all the other folk. So really? Turner is at the meeting, uh, the pre meeting, if you will that eventually leads to the NAACP. But in 1915, Du Bois writes this elegant eulogy about Turner. And Du Bois is this optimistic prophet at this time. 1915, he's thinking, you know, uh, yeah. black folk, if we, can just, if we can just prove our humanity with scientific understanding that white people will understand us better. And he wrote this eloquent, um, eulogy about Turner. He says, Turner is the last of his clan, the uh, the untrained and untethered um, uh, uh, man who hammered his way to the top, you know, and, and, but now we don't have to because we have education and we got all of this stuff and, and we can learn of his um, hard work and efforts, but this is a new day. He, in other words, this is a new day. And he ends up being just as pessimistic as Turner. He does. And Turner, uh, <laughs> and I always say, you know, you know, uh, 
when 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 the boss meets Turner in the great by and by, Turner just sitting back with his arms folded. Told you. <laughs> exactly. I told you so. That's how it was. I told you. You know, and I'm just like, oh man. I mean, because he is matter of fact, I mean, Turner is is a loud mouth, man. By the you just don't about 1906, 1907. When Du Bois is doing working in Atlanta and doing all the stuff that he's doing, um, nobody wanted to hear from Turner anymore. He's the old guy. He is just, uh, you know, he's the old crank. People used to call him a loud mouth. This, this, this fool that just won't shut up, and nobody pays him no attention. Don't pay him no attention. You know, he's the crazy uncle now. You know, but Turner is still spitting fire and spitting truth that everybody else eventually realizes is just only later on. So one of the things about the African-American prophetic tradition is this this arc from an optimistic prophet to a representative one, to a pragmatic one, and finally to the pessimistic one. And you know who else made the journey like that? King. And if King would have lived longer, he would have been more, even more pessimistic. He sure would. Well, what did he tell Harry Belafonte? That I've integrated our people into a burning house. So he was on his road there anyway. So well, I, we, we got to come to an end. I do have one little thing to tell you. All right. My second son, uh, all of my kids uh, went to charter schools. My second son went to Kip Atlanta Collegiate High School. Hmm. But the previous right. name of the building that he went to school was Henry McNeil Turner. Yeah. And they never took the name off the building. Wow. So I want to let you know that his legacy still lives on yes. both in the city and in my own household. Uh, uh, and I'm indebted to him. And we should both together say a shout out to one man who brought us together. Is that right? Should yeah. we talk about Dean True Year, right? Yeah. <laughs> True Year is my guy. I mean, uh-huh. he's, he, he's brought me along and led me along and directed me to you to get uh, again with Henry McNeil Turner. So I'm grateful for him as he's on his sabbatical right well, now. Doc, Doc is part of the Henry McNeil Turner project as one of the advisors of the project. So I just thank him for um, his grace and his um, uh, ability to serve and, 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 and wanting to serve and um, putting me in contact with great people like yourself and others. I am just a blessed man of God because I have met you and I am in your presence tonight. my brother. Well, and I don't think we're going to let go of you because I need my <laughs> students to know you and Bishop McNeil Turner yeah. to give them hope of what we need to do in this generation. So I want to say thank you tonight. Thank you for Kayla. Thank you for everybody. Go get this book. Go read these articles. Learn that decolonizing thought didn't just start in the 21st century. It started in the 1800s and even before that. Thank you very much, Dr. Johnson. Stick Thank around you. after we say goodbye to our hosts. Right. Hey, we're back in two weeks. I got some more stuff for you. So Real Community is back and looking forward to you. Take care.